I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom and a meeting of our Language of Wisdom study group led by Jerry Northrup. He'll give introductory remarks uh, on communicability, simplicity, understandability of wondrous wisdom and other languages of wisdom. Jerry, please. Yeah, what, what I'd like to, to go as I as I get older and, and uh, more stuff's going on and things are slower, less energy and what have you, I'm focusing more and more on, on trying to simplify um, what I understand and what, what we're doing. And I'm really fascinated with that. And I think that, that where I look at, at wondrous wisdom uh, and how to understand that um, is taking me back to this kind of this KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, so that you've got a, a succinct kind of description uh, that can connect with people right off the bat. Because when I first uh, uh, got introduced to Andreas, uh, I was attending this uh, mathematics lecture by John Baez. Uh, Colin Fury was running a thing like that. And, and it was all about this math, the tenfold way and bot periodicity and what have you that I wasn't really understanding all that well. But then I heard this guy ask these two, these questions that use language that none of the other mathematicians were using. Uh, it was words like value and choice and, and what have you. So I looked up Andreas and I saw this, uh, uh, I started reading some of his stuff, this uh, time and space is representation of decision-making. I took a look at that and, and bingo, I had a, a connection uh, that I basically thought I understood that this person saw a lot of the things in the world that I see in the same kind of way, uh, that, that the language appeared to be uh, quite similar. And it turns out it's, it's similar in a symbolic form and, and different in other ways. But there was this, this very quick connection uh, that hooked me. I thought, okay, this is somebody I want to contact and, and work with and what have you, that there's a, a compatibility, a recognition there. And I think uh, because the the uh, the language that I've developed, um, it's it's very difficult to get people to understand it to engage it in any kind of way. And I gather that that's sort of the case with wondrous wisdom as well. And so, are there ways that we can uh, make this more understandable for folks? Because if if you look at it. The basic presentation is is very straightforward and seems to be very simple. Uh, you start with with value. Uh, you look at three languages, three forms of consciousness. You use a, a twosome, threesome, foursome, divisions of everything, and then bingo! Right there, you've got a a conceptual structure, a, a thing like that that should be um, what people could use and understand and and really run with. Could could start to really influence how they think but apparently it doesn't resonate quite that way. So I'm very interested in focusing on how to look at uh, not what we're doing wrong, but how we can package it um, so that it is, and, and not to say that it is a, a simple type of concept, but how do you start? How do you get the interest in something that you then are willing to pursue and understanding that it's many layers and you can go down and as much complexity as you want to or have the stomach for, but it's that initial connection. And that's what I'm I'm going to be playing around with is to how to develop those kinds of approaches. And that's what I would very much like to, on a continual basis, bounce off of the rest of you as to how does this sound? Is, am I missing the, the point? Does this come across easier? And can this, um, can be used to, you know, you go out on the street and you start talking to somebody, here's this great new way of thinking and here's what it is. And you've got, you know, 30 seconds in elevator pitch or a minute or five minutes or what have you. Um, what do you say? How do you put that together? And it's it's probably going to be trial and error in a lot of ways. We'll try things and some will work and some won't, but it's it's a way to deal with this thing that, that Andreas and I spent lifetimes developing these theoretical structures and everybody that doesn't really have that much of a clue as to what we're saying. Now, I think 
Kirby and Daniel definitely um, saw stuff here and 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 there was a connection made with them in a, in a fairly short period of time I think that they are they're sticking with it but you know most people um, I try and talk about what math for wisdom or wondrous wisdom or language of wisdom is about in this uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. So anyway, that's that's what I would like to work on on an iterative basis here and come up with ideas that I can present, you know, uh, hopefully a, a different spin each week and we can see how that that evolves. So that's my uh, my interest in moving forward. And what do you think of that? And um is is this uh, totally in left field or is this something that might work <laughs> well maybe i'll just uh, give a quick affirmation <laughs> to, to say it's um it's uh wonderful the most important thing is that this is something you want to do right so i'm asking us like what is something that we all want to you know that each of us wants to do that we're contributing so it's very clear you want to do that it's very clear it's helpful yeah. You know, so you will do that. And uh, I think um, it's helpful that um, it's a leadership activity. Uh, and so then it just makes real the fact, um, uh, well, that you are the leader of the language of wisdom study group, you know, and that in in this in the important sense that, like, I need to be shaped and um, affected and impacted by you and your leadership. So part of the reason we're here together is to kind of give a different, you know, I have enough influence on this math for wisdom world. Um, yeah. uh, so I don't have to worry about that, but I do have to worry about like, well, can I absorb from others? Like, can you, so we're meeting here so that you could kind of like look at all these things from a different angle. And that's what you're saying you want to do. Right. And then you're not only yes. from your own different angle, but to the wider public. So yeah. maybe to say just uh, that affirmations there, we will do this. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that, that's very much what I would like to do. I mean, it's partly how I understand wondrous wisdom. And then it's, it's partly how I can explain that to somebody else. And that ties back to how I could explain the relational symmetry paradigm or the stuff that I'm doing to other people too. Um, and it's uh, it's something that, that I think as I get older, I am more more focused and interested on on that kind of uh, uh, simple carry forward that could go on. So, so if the rest of you are willing to play games with that, we'll uh, we'll give it a shot. Yeah, so that's what I was going to start with today. I don't know if you want. Start That's perfect. But so what would Kirby Daniel say to that? I think it's um, an attractive feature of wondrous wisdom that once you check into it, it doesn't immediately sort of it, it's it's doesn't have any real bottom to it because you've got this guy, Andreas, who's committed to knowing everything and he's all over the place krebs cycle particle physics and so there's always going to be an angle that you can relate now ants come into it a big in a big way so i feel like it's not naturally an attractive uh thing and then it's not disappointing because you don't get to the bottom of it right away i think of how when you get christmas presents maybe toys like i did as a kid some toys they don't be, they don't keep your interest. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons computers are the best toy is because there's no bottom to the computer. There's just always more. And I think wondrous wisdom has that flavor. So I feel good plugging into it and whatever I do think as a recruiter in a way. I mean that's just natural for me mm -hmm. to think as a recruiter. But then as a Quaker, you have to realize that we are drilled in my school of thought to not be proselytizers or missionaries. We don't, my branch of Quakers does not send out missionaries. So I'm not wanting to go forth and spread the good word. I don't w operate that way. But I do want to create like landing places. Like if people come to my GitHub repository, 
and it says M4W whatever, and then there's a lot of fun stuff there. And then it goes on and links to this thing called Wondrous Wisdom. And they're like, wow, this is all amazing. That That is a good thing. That's how I want it to be. I want them to, I want people to be intrigued and amazed by what's going on. Wondrous, that's the meaning, right? Yeah, I like the word wondrous. It's kind of, I like it. Okay, intrigued and amazed. Daniel? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that. And I'm just struck with the um, kind of simultaneity of a broader sense of language as conceptual structure, like the case system existing independent of any expression. And then especially important for like the accessibility and the engagement and the conversation and like the real time engagement that people have, whether listening to videos, talking to each other, um, inner monologue, and so on, is the linearization. And so I see one effort as kind of um, forward and reverse engineering, like the cathedral, the static, abstract, latent form of what it really is, which technically goes for any concept. Mm -hmm. um and and connections amongst concepts so hence like that being useful to explore relational symmetry wondrous wisdom so on and then um the um threading that and linearizing it in in, in a one word at a time way and that so there's, there's, that's just taking a path through the space and using the words to to weave a path through the space knowing that it, there's so many different kinds of paths to weave um so i'll just um add i mean First of all, it's just wonderful that we're able to have this high quality, you know, meeting, high quality letters, um, high quality I don't know, people is probably not the right word, but just energy. And so that's really, really important. Uh, and there's lots of ways to destroy that. So first of all, to say like this is partly um, accidental, partly by design, right? I mean, like this is but this certainly is desirable what we have now. And then the question is, where do we go with this? And so. Uh, everybody kind of like offering their direction, pursuing it is the way we would want to go, that people have this natural energy, like Jerry is saying, you have this natural energy to make this more understandable. So, but maybe just to show like how that fits in the bigger picture. Uh, first of all, kind of like Kirby said, it's the endeavor of like knowing everything, applying that usefully. That's a very scattered endeavor. Like, you know, there's, it's not like I walked up and said, this is how it's going to be. You know, this is the concept, right? And it's going to be this, 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 this. It's all organized ahead of time. No, this is a just <laughs> this is uh starting from a place of ignorance and just saying well could i know anything so the idea that well the concept of divisions of everything and the concept of everything was a very important starting point for a person like me and that was basically coming from this connection between well knowing everything you want to know something you want to know something absolutely and then fighting that whole you know time that where that was possible so um, so first to say, like, those are natural problems. It still isn't quite like I can now, you know, maybe after 20 years of working on it, I was able to say, well, the main aphorism I would say, you know, in one sentence is that God does not have to be good, right? Like, what is this all about? Like, that's the main crux of all of life, let's say, from the point of view of wondrous wisdom and what, and it's about eternal life, saying that life is the fact that God is good, but eternal life, you know, growing forever, learning forever, living forever is about realizing that this God beyond us and this good within our world, they're disconnected. And just then that's the condition for growth. So I don't really start from that, but I mean, that's that's um, that's that's one handle on it. Another handle, like, you know, this concept of everything division. There's all these different handles, like the deepest value. You know, so if you have somebody who maybe isn't interested, but, but they may have a deepest value. And so how do all these have to connect? It's still not clear. But what... Um, what are the so maybe what are the goals just in terms of outreach? Ultimately, yeah, like to rule the world, you know, to get everyone involved, to have this kingdom of heaven, you know, etc. Great.
But now it's just to have us, like to love us, invest in us, uh, care about us so that we feel that there's a reason to go on, right? And then to think, well, okay, how, how to expand, like very concretely, like it's been taking me a long time, but I'm trying to write a transcript of the bot periodicity video so that I could, uh, which is an hour long, takes a long time to get the transcript in readable form or to make it, you know, presentable. So that I could go to Todd Trimble, who I met at the uh, Category Theory Zulip chat. I could go to back to Francis Howard and say, hey, I did the video, but here's the transcript. Would you look at it? Could we work on that? Could you think about it? You see, I know those people because those are people I can learn from. It's fantastic if there's people who could teach me something, right? Like, so those are people uh, about things I care about. So number one, like a very small audience, very select people who would actually, who have already shown some interest and to go back to those people and recruit them. Then there's other groups maybe like, but it's really on that kind of level, like pick two or three people who've already shown interest and then kind of approach them to say, hey, we're like France is an example. I connected France, he gets our emails. We're doing this series of videos, but basically he hasn't really shown much more interest. And so it'll all kind of like just disconnect, but he'll be out on the radar. But see, those are worth investing in. Whereas like getting random people, uh, like the thing that didn't work, I went to the category theory, applied category theory seminar, I mean, conference last year. Uh, they rejected my paper, which uh, since then has got like 6,000 views, you know, on the Yoneda Iberi. <laughs> Three people rejected it. I went there anyways. Um, I had like 10 conversations with people for 20 or 30 minutes explaining about wondrous wisdom, how it connects to category theory. Everyone seemed interested. Everyone said, yeah, you could contact them, etc." And then not a single person replied to my emails. And I just never want to do that again, you know, because it's like, they're kind of interested theoretically in some level, but they're not personally, they don't need this. I need to, me personally, I need to focus on the people who need this. Like Jerry needs it, you know, for example. So um, it's getting, and so we have a hierarchy of ways that people can get involved. Like people can see the videos. They do find us. Very uh, educated people find us. Maybe one in a hundred will comment, you know, say, or maybe one in 30 will subscribe, you know, so we've got almost a thousand subscribers. So we have all that. So I'm not really worried about um, finding more people or making it more understandable. I'm worried about like, kind of like Kirby said, evangelizing through showing, you know, through example. So if we have a project like that table of frameworks, let's say, or conceptual structure, we say like, we work on this, it's interesting, we're getting something that's happening. That's something you can show to somebody and then they go, oh, I like that, I want to join that. You see, you show instead of having, because explaining just takes forever. It's really not worth it to explain this. I think in a way from a PR standpoint, what attracts me to wondrous wisdom with respect to say synergetics is I'm kind of running away from, I'm kind of a refugee from like sacred geometry. There's mm -hmm. already so many YouTube, such a large genre you know, I get back into using phi, like the golden proportion. And to many ears, that sounds like I'm making a concession, like I'm falling back into mm. something we've escaped from, but not really. It's much better than that. And that's why I cite David Kosky a lot because of the beast modules, so-called. It's hardcore, interesting geometry. I feel the same way about quad rays. It's legitimate um content for people into linear algebra whatever they think of it it's in there with that kind of math so i'm kind of running away from sacred geometry and jumping into what i consider a deeper swimming pool which has all of your topics in it like bot periodicity and so on it's mm -hmm. like endlessly deep and i'd rather <clears throat> sort of when the train comes to a station, I'd rather they get out at wondrous wisdom than that they get out at some kind of like UFOs built the pyramids place right. or something like that. That's helpful to know. That's <laughs> you want to counter counter that, Daniel, or you want to support the UFOs or no? Well. It, it makes me think about like, okay, we could talk about how many of this building and what did that mean at, at that time? I'm in this, the soul, solar system and all that. But then when you look at the polyhedra um, and the cosmic hierarchy, isn't a question arising 
who built this and how was this built? How did this come to be? In a theological sense or in a, in what kind of sense? I think in an open sense. Mm -hmm. Including, inclusive of theology or... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Whereas if you're going to ask about the pyramids or something like that, it's going to be an architectural question that then secondarily, maybe you go down the rabbit hole and then you end up to the maths. Whereas mm -hmm. to... um look at the maths themselves is already like the doorway into the deeper question. Well, and I want to add, um, we do have a, a good, um, <laughs> almost dominant subculture of Bucky Fuller uh, enthusiasts in math for wisdom is certainly our probably most important subculture. Uh, so um, uh, in my life, I would just say like, I've bumped into him a couple times. Um, actually, my cousin went to, um, University of uh, Southern Illinois in Carbondale. I don't know where. Okay, so Bucky had just, I think he got there just when Bucky was maybe dying or dead or whatever. Maybe he was there you know, in freshman year or something. But of course, certainly there was a big, uh, and not that he spent all his time there. Uh, he wasn't there that often, but uh, uh, in Carbondale, I think. But uh, so that's, I think, when I was certainly aware of him. Um, and then uh, maybe I was aware of synergetics. The point. I just never connected because I never saw the... Um, metaphysical depth of it, let's say, or content, you know, and the geometry just seemed more on the sacred side and just felt like, you know, I wasn't really into math anyway. So in, in on that, I wasn't looking for, I wasn't looking for a mathematical thing, I was looking for something under the math, you know. So I just, yesterday, I think I just said, look, well, try to look at, look at the synergetics, you know, I don't know why I didn't do this early, but, but like I quoted, like he, his thinking is very, his, starting point is very similar to mine. I started as a child. He started as an adult, but basically it's similar. Now, he's a throwback in his time. So like, I think he really believed in absolute truth. Like when he talks about these um, generalized principles, right? Like that's just, he's not going to say absolute truth because it was in a time where already like, you know, look what it was like. His counterparts are uh, the existentialists, you know, the structuralists, the post-structuralists, you know, this is all going on with him. He's just like, seems like a dinosaur compared to all that uh, in the way that I am, let's say. So we have that in common, so to speak, um, on the metaphysical instinct side. But he's more of a materialist. Like for him, what was real is the external world, um, which is architecture, let's say, right? Or, you know, physical forces or et cetera. Like for me, I'm more of an idealist, or maybe I'm absolutely an idealist. Like, I just don't go into the reality of all that. So that's why he emphasized different, you know, he got into different things. But for example, I just looked up uh, this idea of a system, you know, that there's these six, when you have a system, there's six things. There's the things inside from the universe, the things from outside. There's the things prior, there's the things subsequent. There's the system itself geometrically, and then there's what coincides. Okay, so you get four plus two. Well, I know what four plus two is. Four plus two is the representation, I mean, or the conceptions, when you have a division of everything, there's either four ways to look at it or two ways to look at it. You get six ways, you see. So first of all, like, that's the power of wondrous wisdom. It's like, I know how to riff with this, you see, because I'm familiar. Like, I know, like, people say tetrahedron, tetrahedron. Well, look, like, the geometric tetrahedron, I have nothing much to say about. But the fact that if you have four corners, let's say, and four choose two ways of choosing, you know, there's six ways of choosing two corners, which is an edge. Well, four plus six happens. I mean, that's that's absolutely central. Like all those 24 fold diagrams say you have what's before a system, you have a system. The system looks like four plus six. The system is a tetrahedron. <laughs> so that's how I came up with my quote unquote tetrahedron. And you just need the corners and the edges and nothing else matters, let's say, right? So the, all this other stuff that it's physical, it's geometrical, blah, blah. No, it's just four a set of four things you need for a system and you have so like four like pierce will have three kinds of sign but there's really a fourth thing the thing itself and you take those four and you pair them in six ways you get the qualities of sign you have it all together it's ten or you have the ten commandments or you have blah 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 okay go on jerry yeah i i have a an interesting sort of story about bucky fuller um uh, when lynn was at syracuse uh she went to a lecture that Bucky gave and she thought he was absolutely phenomenal and very, very exciting, very inspirational. Uh, 
everybody was giving him a standing ovation. And, and this was back in the, uh, you know, mid 60s. Uh, and so she went out and she bought a lot of his books and she read the books and she didn't get anywhere near the excitement or understanding that she got from the lecture from the books. So there was something about what he said that is very different than what what he wrote in in terms of of how it it came across, and it, it's that kind of how how do you achieve that kind of connection? Um, but whether you can do it with writing or, or verbally or what have you, that I mean, some people are just charismatic speakers and they they can can suck you in whether you understand what they're talking about or not. But I I think it it's an interesting sort of of uh, issue as to how do you generate the connection, which can then lead to investigating the what is what is behind it and if, whether that's written down understandably or not. It, interestingly, uh, I mean, that's very, very interesting to hear. I don't know if it's just generational or just different styles, but like personally, I've probably never sought out a recording of Fuller speaking. I've listened to several, but I've never found the linearization to be transformative per se, whereas the writing, and then not not culminating, but but transforming again after I moved on from the critical path and nine chains to the moon onto synergetics itself. That was where I felt like I was able to walk around in the space, rather than be on um like the Disneyland ride taken you know at this pace with his um uniqueness which i respect as a person and then um and then as we i guess we'll proceed on like axiomatizing synergetics or related and, and implementing in code that depersonalizes puts more space between the bundle of experience and the person and the story and, and the bios and something that is not that. And so like, I, I also really like personas like Fuller and so on. And yet um, the persona is often what grants a lot of the immediacy to the spoken language. Like I'll give one other anecdote, um, anonymized to protect the innocent. Like I TA'd for a well-known professor at Stanford. And it was a class where multiple teachers were giving sections. And the well-known professor seemingly, again, I don't, I don't know if study, et cetera, et cetera, but um, students attended lecture the most, studied the least, demonstrated the least improved understanding because they felt like they were getting a podcast in real life and walked away very satisfied but then they, again, speculating, did not look deeper. It was merely engaging enough that the lecture was exciting and special. And so that's kind of like a little bit of a trade-off because obviously if it's not engaging, then no one's in the room. But then if it is the kind of thing that's engaging in the mass attention economy right now, the coefficient of retention will be low, which which is also fine. So it's like, it's fine either way, but just that it's an interesting trade-off with the writing being more self-guided and speaking being more like you're along for the ride. And and to kind of jump off from there, uh, just regard with me and Jerry, you know, and Jerry is like Thomas Gaidosik, you maybe saw like, as a person who probably understands me best, but like Jerry might be second, or at least, you know, the one who's really making an effort to understand. And I think it's important to um, say, like, it's it's wonderful that we, on the surface, you know, we have very similar diagrams. I think that's one reason I put those diagrams out is so people like Jerry could find it. Because if you're like, you know, that's for you, right? Like, and you found it and it worked, right? Like the yeah. flower and the bee. But um, 
the crucial thing, though, like after a year of looking at each other, and I'm starting to understand better Jerry's uh, thinking, but the crucial thing is that there are many deep differences. And so it kind of like where, like, does Jerry really understand what I mean by the twosome, threesome, foursome? Probably not really in the full way, you know, even these most basic things, right? And so yeah, the that, question is like, I got to work on. Yeah, well, I think like if we could really understand, you know, intuitively, like, so it's not like, oh, I like the lecture. I've been to the lecture. No, it's like, can you do the exercises? Can you do the problems? Can you make up your own exercises? So um, I think just going through the two, some three, some fours and collecting examples is one way to do it. But talking about examples, you know, and I think many of them, um, maybe to stress, there's many conundrums I have. I just don't know. Like legislative, executive, uh, judicial is a breakup conceptually that I was aware of, you know, probably in junior high. And then I meditated on these. Another one was the Holy Trinity, let's say. So certainly growing up, like these are the types of things I thought a lot about these mysteries. Like how do they fit together? Like what is that? What is the deep idea? You know, it wasn't clear. But even to this day, like taking a stand, following through and reflecting, I know that that fits with being, doing, thinking. The difference being, though, that being, doing, thinking are kind of like isolated modes. But you can see how they fit together if you realize, oh, this is these are just subjective modes that you experience when you're going through this learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting. So if you want to define being, doing, thinking, it's say that's a conception. I talked about six conceptions. That's one conception of this underlying thing that does even not conceivable. The, the, the threesome which is very difficult. It's not really conceivable. It's just something we, I postulate, you know, because there's four ways to conceive it. Well, supposedly it's there, but then supposedly the structure is like that. Supposedly you, you live that way. So being, doing, thinking. Okay. Then there's another conception is one, all, many. And if you look at the introduction to math for wisdom, I go on for half an hour about one, all, many. Uh, it's quite mathematical in terms of like computer science. Like either you it's a search for constancy. Either you search, either you find one example of constancy or you don't. But if you don't, then you're constantly, it's constantly unconstant. So all is constant. So either one is constant or all is constant. And then the assumption when you do this is that every time you're selecting something and then you're judging, you know, whether it's constant, how do you know it didn't change? So it's it's got to be this regularity. It's got to be multiply constant. So that's a way that wondrous wisdom defines one, all, many. No one else, I don't think, is able to define one, all, many. No one else is able to define being, doing, thinking, I don't think. So this is it's these mind games, these mental actions. Now, legislative, executive, judicial, I kind of assumed, well, it's kind of like, you know, individual, communal, universal is a way to say one, many, all, let's say. I kind of imagine like, you know, you do as an individual, like the executive should be unitary, Traditionally, at least, you know, not maybe ants don't, but like, you know, there's a unitary executive. Uh, there's um, universal, like when I think, it's like I'm remaking the whole universe. When I am, it's like I'm part of a collective, you know, uh, com communal. <laughs> and then, um, um, so the question is like legislative, executive, judicial. Well, okay, executive would be like the one. Now the question is legislative. Is that like the universal? Is that thinking? And then, that's kind of like what I assumed, but it's probably not. Like you legislate first, then you execute, then you have judicial review. I don't know. You know, I get confused. And so I've been thinking about her for 40 years. I still don't know. But so that's why if we had a community of people kind of, you know, take the examples like that, you see. There's a lot to just even basic questions to try to collect and think about. It's it's not obvious because these are inconceivables. That's the problem. Like these are deeper than our ability to conceive. So you have to. Yeah, that, that's I, really hard. I I get a sense of that in the in this notion that uh, we talk about language being a linear connection of words, but if words are more like quaternions, so something you can't really connect in any meaningful way linearly. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that comes back to, you know, sort of what you're saying about the threesome. Of it's like certain things, but not like like others. You don't really see the legislative, executive, judicial as an example of the threesome. You sort of see being, doing, thinking as a sort of an example. Is that, is well, that what you're well, saying? Well, there's an, the point is that there's an underlying structure which you just can't. Yeah. You live, but you don't conceive. You see, conception is already a degree of reflection if you conceive something. 
Whereas life is just direct. You know, you directly live the threesome. It's the most, it's 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 a description of direct living. You know, I took a stand, I followed the reflex. So even when Kirby says, well, I I made a point in my life, you know, where I wasn't going to, uh, you know, uh, be, let's say, proactively taking a stand. Okay, but that's taking a stand, you know, in some kind of sense. Like, you know, that's how I read it. So uh, this, is, but see, there's a way to conceive that, like being, doing, thinking is what it feels like. But see, when it feels like that, you don't see the shifts. You just see the, you know, I'm in the mode of being. I'm in the mode of doing. I'm in the mode of thinking. When you're in the mode of doing, you don't think of it as I'm following through. But that's what you're probably doing. You know, you're following through. What are you doing, right? You're following through. But it doesn't feel like that way. You're just doing it, right? Like, so that's how it feels. Um, Something, and maybe more for another time, but um, I mentioned these goodwill exercises. That is a good, oh, and... I've mentioned like that I want to investigate what languages are like for verbalization for like, you know, how meaning arises, basically how words are created or, or they get meaning ingested in them. How do things come to matter? So those goodwill exercises, I think that it relates to verbalization very much and how and what it's doing. It's explaining how you set up this dialectic between the truth of the world and the truth of the heart. So the standard case, and this was like in the 90s, I uh, had friends, they encouraged me to, in Chicago, to uh, start applying my philosophy, especially Joe Damo, he's a community organizer. So I said, well, I'd like to do it on uh, situations that rile me, you know, that uh, where in my heart, I believe one thing, but in the world, it's all different. It's kind of like this agent niche, maybe difference, you know, and it, it just, it just uh, from active inference, and that riles me, right? So I spent the whole year, we would meet every two weeks, and I'd do a newsletter every two weeks. And then then uh, what figured out was um, the person who's riled is always wrong. <laughs> you see, like, so there's these tests, basically. But so there's four tests to figure out. Well, that's one test, but like there's three other tests. How do you distinguish the truth from the heart and the truth of the world? And the classic example, which was for me, like paradigmatic, was like, I used to get riled by the homeless panhandling in Chicago. It just bothered me. Like, you know, I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to do with this. I didn't know what it was all about. And so there's two truths. One is that like my help can make things worse, right? Someone's going to take my money and then drink it and go beat up their wife. Let's say. Like it's possible, right? Like the other one is that if someone asks for help or needs help, you should help, right? That's another truth. And they're both true. And the question is, Okay, but which one is from the heart and which which one's relevant? And the truth from the heart's relevant. So which one's from the heart? And it turns out, well, I was riled, so I was wrong. I was focused too much on the my help can make things worse. That means that's not from the heart, that's from the world, because I'm riled. You know, that's what makes me riled. There's three other tests though that may be more convincing. One is that uh, logical direction. Like if you follow the truth of the heart, the truth of the world will also be relevant, but not the other way around. So for example, if I say, hey, you know. I should help, right? People need help. Then very quickly, it'll be relevant. Yeah, but you don't want to make things worse, right? Like, But if you just say, oh, I don't want to make things worse, well, then it'll never be relevant to help anybody because you just stay away, you see. So it's very interesting. Those two truths have that logical direction. Another test is epistemological. It says um, you can see the truth of the world from examples. You can see examples where your help can make things worse. But the truth of the heart is tautological. Like you're basically born with it. You're born with this idea that, oh, I sh people need help. I should help, right? You can't show that because it's, you can't show what you should do. Right? It's not showable. And and it's just tautological. It doesn't really say anything in a certain sense um, to, that you could show. So that's from the heart. And then finally, um, the topic, let's say the topic is providing help. And here's an example of the whether, what, how, why. So like, on any topic, there's these four levels, and the truth of the heart is a broader than the truth of the world. So why being the broadest, whether being the narrowest, like what kind of help should I give? Well, help that does not make things worse, right? But why am I giving help? I'm giving help because I should. You see, it's the it's the why that you're doing it. It doesn't have to be effective, you know. I'm doing it because I should. <laughs> so so when you realize all these things, then you reorient to say, look, I was wrong to focus on the other thing. That'll take care of itself. What And so there's like an example of the twosome there. You already had to apply the foursome. Then there's example of threesome. Okay, so where am I stuck? 
uh, you know, taking a stand, falling through and reflecting. So I was stuck in falling through. I, I actually believed the truth of the heart, but I wasn't doing it. So I did an exercise. I called them goodwill exercises where, okay, got together with friends so that I get outside of my shadow, not the outside of my experience. I'd say, okay, we're all going to take a stand on how we would help a homeless person. And so I said, well, you know, I'd maybe give them some drawing pencils or just something to do so that their life could be meaningful or whatever, just support them, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Then we went out and everyone went out to help a homeless person, find help. And so I found this person. He was in the alley. He was cursing at me. I took him out to a Chinese place for lunch. He couldn't eat very much because his stomach was pretty small. Then we went out to, he was a painter. He had been out of prison. We went to see like, you know, could he get some jobs painting or something? People are sad. After an hour, he got tired and that was the end of the story. So, but I learned that like, you know, like he didn't want to go to, um, he didn't want to go to a shelter because he would go on the, on the north side to cash his check. And that was the, at the currency exchange, that was the one social interaction that he really liked was the guy would cash his check. Basically, that was his social life. So, so that's a little window into person's life. So, and then to realize I could do that. I could help somebody, you know, it just made me feel very different about the whole thing. So, um, but that's an example of the three cycle that there's three different places you could get stuck. Oh, and so then we went back and we reflected on it. Like, oh, he didn't need pencils to draw, but like he needs social, he needs this uh, social interaction. You know, where like you talk to people, you hang out to people. So, oh, so the point I'm bringing this up though, is that this, I have like 40 examples where we set these up, maybe 20 I did. But the point is that you go into your feelings, like you ask, like, what, what, you know, you're riled about homelessness. What would make you feel bad? What would make you feel better? You get these two different statements. You figure out what's the topic, which is basically like a word. Then you ask about the topic. What are the truths? You get these two truths. But they're always aligned, like they're aligned in a very careful way. And you can see that it's kind of like almost like DNA strands, like you have these choices. It's like a catalyst, I want to say, like in the where the catalyst aligns possibilities, let's say, going forwards and backwards. And then you get these choices you can make. And it makes things a thousand times faster that you have these templates for aligning things. And lots of the things I've been doing, um, they have these, whether it's bot periodicity, they have the topological insulators, you have these gaps between valence band and computation band. You have like these learning thresholds. If you have enough kinetic energy, if you have enough bouncing around or randomness or bumping in it, you can hop over the learning threshold. But if you have like a language like wondrous wisdom, or if you have the right questions to ask, you lower the learning threshold. It becomes much, much lower and learning can happen much more faster. So verbalization seems to be like, ver words are really coded questions. And those questions are ways of catalyzing our thinking. So they're very convenient. And I think that this is, this data maybe can show how that catal catalyzation of thinking works. And this was a long aside, but maybe before Daniel leaves us, whatever, just to ask Cherry, like, if we go back to your looking for a better way of thinking, you see, maybe if we focused on that, that would help us know what well, exactly we want to make understandable. Yeah, you know, my, my point comes back to this. You You were describing the application or what have you of how to help the homeless person from the perspective of the threesome and, and what have you. But given the understanding and what you've gone through, how does that actually come up with something that society could use to help the homeless person? Well, it turned out it wasn't about the homeless person. It was about me and my feelings and how to help okay. about helping, you see. And so the point is, is that like I had it gotten backwards that I thought that, well, I should focus on my help. We don't want to make things worse, right? Like it turns out that takes care of itself. You know, right. I should focus on. Yeah. So this idea, like telling people what's from the heart, what's from the truth, untangling all these things. That's very practical. The problem okay. was, was that nobody wanted to do these with me. You know, I had friends. I had a lot of good friends at that time in my life. And they came and we did this and, you know, maybe one or two or three people would show up. But the point is, is that. People did not want to challenge their ways of thinking because uh, this is probably like my belief in God. My belief in God was like, oh, God will watch over me. I can let go of myself and I can take myself up again and I can do this. You know, I can go engage homeless people, right? Like say on the street. That is not normal behavior, you see. So nobody wanted to or just simply letting go of your own life and then just doing something um, that you haven't experienced. But what it did, though, it was like psychotherapy without scars. 
You know, instead of a psychotherapy said, oh, you feel this way because your parents did blah, blah. No, it says you feel this way because you just think wrong. <laughs> if you thought right, it'll go away. <laughs> like This very powerful psychotherapy. I don't know. Daniel, any questions? So, any last points for yeah, us? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that relates, I mean, just at a first pass to cognitive behavioral approaches like CBT, yeah. cognitive behavioral therapy, because it focuses on the actual methods and the decision points the internal covert attentional decision points and then the engagements with the niche and mm -hmm. those are the actual bases and then if somebody is going to take like a symbolic or, or a metaphorical or a social lens or some other kind of narrative to to deliver the cognitive or the behavioral adjustments that may be the most direct through line, or it might be a total, you know, 30 year diversion. And so you can see like the, the, the utility for politics, which is central to all our problems. You see, it's very good. It can make for a very humane politics. And in terms of math wisdom outreach, I think one thing I would encourage is like, can we attract people from different worldviews? You see, not to try to convert people to be interested, but say, look, are there people like from Buddhist or Hindu or Confucianist or, you know, African or Native American or whatever, like, you know, the medicine wheel, like any kind of worldviews or say, like, they're already doing this. Would they like to have a uh, more worldviews involved? Because that's what wondrous wisdom can do. And but certainly women, you know, I think I've mentioned that several times, you know. You, will you have to go now, Daniel? Or no, I'll hang out for a little bit. It's all good. So, yeah, the the question continues to come back to where does it go? Um, well, how so? How would you picture where it goes? Like, where would you like to be going? Well, from my perspective, you know, I come up with this. The structure and it and it uh, it seems to me to be um, fairly transparent as as to how you would think and and it makes some of these problems that I'm concerned about uh, the solution becomes pretty obvious uh, but I haven't been able to convince anybody of that or or of the approach because it's like climate change. Well, there's a technological thing, but we have the technology, it's the will. So then you say, okay, now it's how people think. And I go back to this and I, and I think I come up with a solution uh, that basically this is all being driven by the accumulation of excel excessive wealth and equality. And that mm -hmm. that's what drives the autocracy. That's what drives the sexism and the racism and the um, exploitation of, of people and that if there's why doesn't why wouldn't eight billion people tell two thousand billionaires they know that you have no right for that amount of money that should be taken away and distributed to solve the other problems maybe we leave you with a uh, hundred million and you cap it that way you remove the incentives for the uh, autocratic discriminatory behavior, the incentive being personal gain or, or comfort. But, you know, so that there's there's something there, but it doesn't it doesn't come across. How, how do and, you and how do you do think that that'd be I, I think how, how would how would you implement that? How would how would you how do you see that happening? Uh well, the only way you can implement that is if the understanding gets out so the eight billion people who are basically the victims of this understand that that's what's happening to them and they don't need to put up with it. Yeah. Well, so then, but could you clarify, yeah. like, how do they, how do they learn to understand and how do they, how do they not put up with it? It, it comes back to the, to the same. This is what I think the, the question is with you. You, you see these kinds of things, but like, again, the question is how, do, how do we get it out so that people see that or understand that? But he, okay, so that's one, and that's maybe more understandable. You just you do YouTube videos; people understand that. Let's say, but then what do they do? Well, let's say everyone knows, right? What what would you have them do? How how do you think the change would happen? How do you picture that? I don't know. 
Okay, so that's important. Okay, that's fine. You don't know. Yeah. See, my my approach is very different. Like, I just think like, um, <laughs> if climate change is the big problem, that's not my big problem. But like, if it was like, it's very simple solution is just if everybody in the world, not everyone in the world, 10% of the people in the world, let's say, if 10% of the people were said, we're going to pray about this, and we're going to ask God to, uh, you know, deal with climate change, and we're going to do it once a week, the problem would be solved. If there was a really fervent prayer movement, you see, first of all, it would co-opt the right. You see, there'd be no, there'd be no issue. Like to say, the right could lead this, basically. To say, we're going to pray God to deal with climate change. God will get the credit for dealing with climate change. Okay, it'll be a so, sign of like, are you with God or are you against God? I'm with God, right? Like, we're going to deal with climate change, right? Yeah. It's just a very simple solution, you see. So uh, you just get everyone around the world, like, the question is like, well, how do we pray to God? See, and that's what wondrous wisdom can do. Say, like, we, we pray, right? So it's not hard to pray for climate change to fix it. See, and once so, you have prayer for climate change, it changes the rules. It says, well, look, like, if we're praying God for climate change... Who's in the way? Like, who's the enemy of God, right? Well, maybe this excessive greed is part of the problem. You see? How does that square with God's yeah. interest in dealing with climate change, right? Or like, what? why are we, what is God, see the whole thing is like, why is God not doing anything about climate change? What is the purpose of climate change? What is climate change? See, it all becomes theological. It should be, I think. But let, let, let's flip this around now and say, okay, if, if this is the way you deal with climate change, then how would you get the principles of wondrous wisdom so that people would believe that and would do that? Well, I think it's kind of obvious, but it's not my problem. I don't, you know, it's not my planet, really. But um, but the thing that I would do is like, like we're saying, like, at this stage, okay, we have four people in this room. But like, if we could, you know, let's say half a year from now, have, let's say, 12 people or, you know, 20 people, like from different worldviews. So like, Islam is Pashtun. That's just fantastic, right? Like, but just to think of every possible worldview. And so whether it is a quantum physics, you see, whether it is uh, biochemistry, whether it is uh, like any discipline to say, look, can you like Bucky Fuller's example? Like, can we take Bucky Fuller? Can we take active interests and just translate them all so that we're starting to get these languages that connect? Right. And okay. see, so we're like right now, like. Wondrous wisdom is outside the academic community, just in the way that Bucky Fuller kind of like is outside. You know, it's just not because we both believe in absolute truth. You know, like we both believe that there's principles or something that just doesn't fit. But see, if we had reason for people to to bring us in to like kind of like make us normalize us, right? Like a process of normalization, not where we become more palatable, but where we are recognized as um, meaningful, you see, because of cool things that uh, we're able to do. So we have to do cool things that would kind of give us street cred. I think that's what we have to do. Yeah. Okay. Which which could be like the ecological intelligence. Like, so you've mentioned, I, that, you know, that, that, like, that's if we had a vibrant own. program for that, see, that's cool. Then all of a sudden say, look, this works. You see? Well, that, that's sort of what I'm trying to do with Timberfish. Like we, there's one of these projects is there's a 120 unit trailer park. Mm -hmm. And they, are all on septic tanks, which are then pumped into a pond, which flows into a little creek and it's polluting. So DEC has come back and said, can't do this anymore. You gotta put it in a treatment system. Well, mm -hmm. treatment system that's gonna solve that problem, conventional ways is ridiculously expensive and mm -hmm. people living in a 120 unit trailer park can't afford that kind of, of uh, cash outlay. So that's where the, the timberfish technology can give a low cost solution to that that would comply with the speedies permit and not the other. So it's this kind of thing that if you could do, then you've got something you can show. And then you say, now this relates back to a different way of thinking that actually could apply to social problems as well as ecological problems. So that's that's kind of like the example of what, what you're saying is, is, yeah, what we need to do is, is show something that people would say it's cool and then they want to explore and dig back into it as, as to why you've done this or, or how it works. And and that's true for anything, but then and then in terms of whether it's relational symmetry paradigm or wonders, it's like, what is that contributing to make this cool? You see, so like, and maybe like, like with regard to the waste issue, like one way to approach it is to universalize it to say, okay, Let's just consider all the waste issues in the world, right? Like, so a very natural one is like human waste, right? Like, 
So I talked to Ben DeVry. Uh, he was here, I think, maybe a couple weeks ago. Right. And so he said that, you know, Andres, the most, uh, <laughs> the most uh, ecological thing actually is to uh, compost your own waste, human manure. And that was just kind of boggling to me. But then that, it turns that, out, so I do that. That, doesn't, that, that doesn't work for years. New York City. You right. Do but, but, York okay. City. But, but the point being that, like to say, if we had a universal solution, say, look, the best thing you can do is to compost your waste. This is how you do it. Number one. Yeah. Why can't you? Then you go on. Okay. There's certain reasons why we can't. Those are limitations. We Then we do the next best thing. Then we do the next best thing. See, and so you kind of build up this whole logic, right? Like, and then you look at, well, what are the principles inherent in all that logic? So they include things like, you know, solve the problem locally, right? Like turn, you know, what, like turn problems into assets, right? Like, et cetera, right. you know, to live rhythmic. See, the, the, the issue is like, you have a very, um, if you just looked broader at the solution, it's more engageable and the principles become more clear. And then it just comes because you have a special solution, basically. But the but special solution can't be very um, exciting in a certain sense because it's special. But if you say, no, this is just a example to show like what the general um, deal is like, right? Does that make sense? Like to say, see, so it's a, it's a beautiful, like you, you know, here's a full fledged thing, but it's it's because there's many limitations. You have to deal with this. You have to deal with that. You have to do this. It, it, it's very illustrative, but to also show the bigger picture. Where does it fit in the bigger picture of what people should do or can do and do do? You know, right? Like in terms of do do, right? Yeah. Um. So this is helpful, very uh, like for Jerry, from us to understand, and especially me to understand, like you know, what are you seeking? And it starts from that looking for a better way of thinking and maybe to help better define, like, what do we mean by a better way of thinking, right? I think that that would be um, to pull it back uh, I, from wisdom. Yeah, I think this comes right back to let, let's really take a look at wondrous wisdom. Uh, I will try and take a look at it to see how I understand it and, and mm -hmm. what that means. And then we can talk about where I'm missing the boat and that sort of stuff. And I will do that from the perspective of my thinking and the relational symmetry paradigm and in auto do and the eco technology. But it's to come back and and to to see and and for me it, it it always comes back as to how are we going to get this out so that somebody else can see and understand a different way of thinking which will allow them to solve the problems. So we're not going to dictate how people should solve problems. Just give them a tool. So it goes back to the Bucky Fuller quote, uh, so that, that they can understand and, and get the right solution. And so for me, it's um this just maybe this is where I've gotten to like in my general principle, like I just set it up right and God will scale. But in terms of setting it up right, it means like if we can have a small functional investigatory scientific community where people are doing things that they really care about where the methods are, you know, related to what they care about. And then to show that, you know, wondrous wisdom helps to make the synergy work because it gives them a shared language, you know, it gives them. So that part, it's not clear uh, exactly like why it would work. Uh, we have to yeah. have people working on things that they care about and then we can see, then we'll be able to see what's the point. So maybe until we, until we have that, we don't really have a basis to show, we don't, I don't have a way to orient myself to say, well, what is this all about? You see, it's scattered. Once we have a society, a little community that's able to apply this for our investigations so that we work together well, then we'll know what to tell people. I think maybe so it's almost a little bit too early in that sense. We need to have a, uh, we still need to prove the concept that this is uh, meaningful. But in terms of the better way of thinking, like uh, it really brings to mind in Wondrous Wisdom, there's the doubts and counter questions. Uh, and so I had that video like, you know, how do you know you're not a robot? But in the, in the overview, I, I'll, I'll be making a video about the counter questions, uh, like which are like, you know, what do I truly want? You know, how does it seem to me? What else should I be doing? Would it make a di any difference? Uh, okay, Kirby Erner, it, 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 it's all right, Kirby. It doesn't make a difference, you're a robot. But uh, what do I have control over? Um, uh, am I able to, you know, I'm able to consider the question uh, uh, and so on, right? Like, so... Um, 
is this is this the way things should be? Am I doing anything about this? So those are the counter questions, and um, they what they do is they throw you out of the box. Basically, the whole point of intelligence is like, can you get outside of your assumptions? Can you get outside your box? So if you can do that, then you're intelligent. If you can, then you're just kind of like not really intelligent, right? Maybe you're a problem solver, but you're not really able to get out of the box. So, um, space is 3D a box, that's right. So um, Daniel, Kirby, more like where, so this is was about like maybe Jerry's interest. Like, so what are your interests? Maybe like, where would you want to do? To... Going back to your threesome, taking a stand, et cetera. As I've mentioned on the listserv, I'm interested in using that picture with regard to organizations, institutions, in other words, DC took a stand, Moscow followed through, oh. Ukraine reflected. You know, it's like the subject of the sentence is not an individual, but an institution, an organization. And so you have to look from the outside. You have to see like a cougar hunting a wild animal. When is, is it taking a stand? When it's crouching, perfectly motionless, mm -hmm. and then it springs into action and starts chasing the beast? Right. Is that follow through? I would think we're so, yeah. on the outside watching. We're not on the inside. So we can't go by, oh, I feel this, I feel that, and therefore I'm taking a stand. It's not about how you feel because we're talking about institutions. But there are group hive mind psychologies, which is where ants come in. It's like I want to look from the outside, sort of from a third person point of view, and say, this is why the ants are fighting in Europe. You know, this is why the ants are fighting mm -hmm. in the Middle East. But I'm not going to try to get in the head of all the ants individually. That's not possible. And, and maybe just to risk what Daniel, what's your thought on that? Uh... Yeah, like the ants as mirror slash subject, subject, double slash object, like if they pursue one task, people say that they have a one track mind. If they switch tasks, people say that they're too scattered to have intelligence. It's like they just can't do anything right for somebody who wants to see them as mechanical. And they can do nothing wrong for somebody who thinks that their natural intelligence is adaptive. And so it's like actually the second level or the higher order of cybernetics on the ant colony mm -hmm. is its own meritous topic. And the proximate layer of developing like simulations and category theory with active infer ants mm -hmm. is like it's like a long-term linux kernel for understanding the compositionality of multi-agent niche modifying systems so i've kind of been taking the test uh, the the um daniel and his co-author um they have this uh, test for consciousness like theories, uh, which is, you know, Wondrous Wisdom has this eight by three by eight theory of consciousness, three minds, eight mental states. And so uh, I actually have this technique where like you focus on the ways of figuring things out, let's say by an ant colony. And the idea is that if you look at that, it doesn't actually say how it things are, you know, who knows how things are, but it does say like, you know, based on what you're able to sense empathize with or figure out you know based on what you see you know in terms of what they're doing this is the way that you would try to engage them let's say right and and and, and get more information and so the idea is to look for two minds so one mind is this kind of like this mass of ants you know foragers etc crawling out and there's this there's this distributed mind okay so that's fine and it does different things and they, they have the, the the flow rates let's say of these ants they're kind of like liquid so to speak. But the idea is uh, from wondrous wisdom and from these cheat sheets and stuff is that there's there's there ought to be another mind. You know, if there is consciousness, there ought to be another mind that kind of functions in a different way. And so the idea that uh, there's this queen deep inside and she has a cohort or nurses, etc. And that there's this whole chain of or maybe hierarchy of zones where uh People aren't walking into the depths and walking out. No, uh, they're transferring semiotic information through like uh, ant grease or whatever, you know, and smells and stuff. And it goes out and it comes back in. And of course, it, it does not happen very fast, but it does give the impression that there must be some kind of like a mood overall, like a chemical mood or, a, you know, that there's 
there's some kind of, uh, somebody's in balance, let's say, in terms of the whole big picture. And so it's just like, who smells what? And one reason I, I gave it like as evidence for that is that like, when you have those cases where in a different species, in the fire ants, I mean, the honeypot ants, where you have, let's say, 10 queens, they came together and some are stronger, some are weaker. And the then they give birth and they have nurses and those nurses take care of them. They're all mixed. But the nurses are friendly to all of them. And then at a certain point for certain queens, the relationship goes sour and the nurses start to be inattentive and then the nurses start to actually be rude and the nurses actually kill them. So the question is like, how did that happen? And the answer seems to be that suggests itself like, well, the ant must have smelled different at a certain point, you know, and maybe it was it maybe a complicated process, whatever, like it smelled one way, everything is fine. But if you start to smell a different way, you're going to get killed. You know, it's just a simple reaction. Like if you smell right, you're nursed. If you smell wrong, you're killed. There's not much thinking involved, but like, how does that, how do you end up smelling right or wrong based on your diet, based on your strength, based on your weakness, whatever, there's different, different reasons, but it's semiotic primarily. And so that's the kind of thing to just, you know, I'm just science fiction inventing, but uh, when you can invent something like that, then you can say, okay, there's two minds. How are they, how do they work together to figure certain things out? Like maybe, you know, to know when to open or close the uh, ant vents in a, you know, in, in a flooding situation, you know, or before a flooding situation. Absolute truth. And then, um, and then you could evoke the consciousness by flirting with that, you know, getting to try to get it to switch back and forth between modes and seeing which way it wants to lean, you know, then it, you could say, oh, it lent this way. It means it was consciousness. It chose to do this mind. It's, you know, it needs to have two minds to choose from. So to have consciousness. So that's a model. I don't know how that fits with, uh, but this is, oh, so the reason I brought this up with regard to what Kirby is saying, like one thing I have not been able to find yet, I'm still looking for is you have a post system. It's like four by six uh, tetrahedron, let's say. I mean, you have a system. Before you have a system, you have these two minds that kind of build it up. And in relating these two minds is a three cycle. Mm -hmm. So where is the ant colony taking a stand, following through, reflecting? I've not been able yet to figure that out. But I think it would, so I don't know, Jason, that's a question. And, but that goes yeah, back to what nested, you're interested in, collective intelligence. Yeah, nested action perception loops at multiple time scales. These, those are, I mean, so... I mean, again, we'll, we'll, we'll um, I think tomorrow continue with the mm -hmm. knowledge engineering, synergetics, ants, mm -hmm. angles. Okay, so that's it. Um, and maybe to ask, um, while we're, you guys, you are really connecting Kirby and Daniel regarding the knowledge engineering, synergetics and stuff. Um, where do you want to take that tomorrow or, or how, how is that? Maybe could you just tell, include us in like, how is that, uh, what's going on with that? Well, we have this discussion you wanted to have about what's appropriate to put on the generic listserv free lists. Oh, well, we can do versus that. Versus yes. these sort of side channel things. Because mm -hmm. what I imagine is getting technical and firing off a lot of emails because I'm inspired at that time to say right to Daniel CCU about some things I'm doing, but I'm not necessarily wanting to flood the lister with all kinds of stuff. I've got my quota to worry about one a day max and stuff like that. Yeah. So I just was thinking we should allow for side channels that maybe later they go to the list, but some parts of them get edited, curated. Like you could easily quote and say, this came across my desk, Kirby writes this, but you know, it doesn't have to be that I verbatim put everything that I send to you and Daniel also to the list. That seems like a dangerous pattern. No, no, no. And so you're creating new patterns. This is what we're trying to do. So you give a nice name to them, side channels, right? And if you think a side channel, or if anyone thinks a side channel's relevant, you know, that you just like to me to keep an eye on it, right? Like you can CC me, right? And then the like idea- Like if I mention saying, you or there's things about about the thread that I think you might want to know about, then I should throw you in the CC. And then what you can do is you can, um, I can presume that if you CC me, then you'll let me use my best judgment to 
take a clip out and then to forward it into the that's understood is sure. that right that makes sense yeah so that's all, that's i think i'll look that's problem solved okay okay any final words maybe from daniel jerry kirby and and jerry what would you like to do for next time what would you where would you where would we go i can't hear you jerry you're on mute I will come up with some specifics as to how I, I think some of these concepts can be reformulated or, or re-expressed and see if that makes sense to you. Okay. Okay. So, and so this is a good way to do it that we're like, you give introductory remar remarks and then we'll, um, we, we proceed from there. And then also if you write a letter, right? Like I, I will, yeah, I'll, I'll try and get these. So you all get it presented ahead of time. Okay. Uh, because I think I think it's beginning to beginning to come clearer to me as to how to how to proceed with that. So Great. at least as a procedure, whether it's it's going to be useful or not, we'll wait and see. Time will tell. But um, I see a path to go. And would Daniel, would you lead us with a prayer? End us with a prayer, I guess. We appreciate this interesting and insightful discussion. We look forward to carrying forward from the stands taken here. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm really getting a lot out of Math for Wisdom. It's expanding my horizons in a variety of ways. Uh, it's challenging and interesting, and there's other people also, uh, a lot of other people also participating. You should try it out. That's all I got to say. What about Patreon support? Oh, um, the Patreon support I give to Math for Wisdom is easiest thing in the world to do. You should try it. Okay. <laughs>